Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this event, which is part of the Center for Comparative and Public Law's Human Rights um, Seminar Series, which is the, the last one that we've organized uh, in 2018. Um, the purpose of this particular panel discussion is to reflect on a recent human rights treaty body reporting process that Hong Kong um, and China underwent uh, in August in Geneva, um, when the committee, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, reviewed China's state report under the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Um, the process, states parties to the treaty um, are required to report to this independent expert committee, which is a treaty monitoring body, which um, monitors and makes recommendations about states, how states are implementing their obligations under this international treaty. Uh, but states parties are required to report every two years. Although, um, in reality, most states do not report every two years. Most states are late, and actually the committee itself has a backlog, <laughs> despite the late reports by many states. Um, but this process, first the state submits its report to the committee, um, and then eventually the committee will have a constructive dialogue with representatives from the government. Um, and in this case, the Chinese government, the central government sent a delegation. Um, but there are also separate delegations from Hong Kong and Macau. And they, they call it a constructive dialogue where the committee asks questions based on the report and also based on issues that have been raised by civil society organizations uh, who often get very involved. In, in the Hong Kong case, civil society has gotten very involved in these types of human rights reporting um, procedures. And they often will uh, submit a sh what's called a shadow report or an alternative report to provide additional information or um, perhaps in many cases contrary information <laughs> to what the government has included in its own report on the situation um, in whichever jurisdiction the committee is reviewing. And, and in this case, we'll be looking at Hong Kong. Um, and then after this constructive dialogue, the committee will issue concluding observations, which list you know, areas where they think that the state is, is progressing, um, but also um, concerns and then making recommendations um, about how the state party can actually do a better job of meeting us, uh, complying with, with the international convention. Um, so I'm, before I introduce our, we have a, a dream team <laughs> of panelists uh, this afternoon, and all of them were participated in this process from civil society um, and went to Geneva in August. Um, I was also part of this, this NGO delegation in August. Um, and so we all have our own reflections about how the process actually worked in Geneva, but also how the process might, what steps we might take going forward to ensure continuing discussion about the various issues that were raised by the committee and raised by NGOs um, in the local uh, context and how to advocate for law reform, policy reform where necessary. Um, but before I introduce each of them and, and ask them to share their reflections, um, I just want to share a few of mine. I won't take very much time, I promise. <laughs> um, um, but um, I did. I started becoming involved in issues related to racial discrimination in Hong Kong back around the year 2000. And I was working for a think tank called the Civic Exchange. Some of you might be familiar with that. Um, and I was asked to write a report about racial discrimination in Hong Kong. And I had n no background. I had no idea what the issues were at that period of time. So I was introduced to this international treaty. Um, and in the course of doing research for the report, conducting interviews, um, looking at government statements, the government had done a public consultation and I was reviewing some of the responses to that, um, I became quite aware of the serious issues in the Hong Kong context and the urgent need to introduce um, 
anti-discrimination law that covered the grounds of race, which we did not have at that time. Um, and then got involved in advocating based on, on the report. Um, and also the CERD committee, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, did review Hong Kong's report in 2001. So around the same time that I was working on my own um, research. Um, and they, in 2001, the committee um, recommended, and not just recommended, it was a very strong recommendation that the Hong Kong government needed to introduce a race discrimination ordinance, similar to the other anti-discrimination laws that we have already, or we had already on the books in Hong Kong, including the sex discrimination ordinance and the disability discrimination ordinance. Um, and there were other human rights bodies that were making similar recommendations around the same time. And in fact, the Committee on the Elimination, or sorry, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights went so far as to tell the Hong Kong government that they were in breach of their obligations under the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And that's very strong language for um, one of these expert human rights treaty bodies. Um, Shortly after, the government did introduce a race discrimination bill and draft legislation and tabled it in 2006 um, in LegCo. Um, and many advocates, well, people who have been advocating for some time for anti-discrimination legislation on the grounds of race were very disappointed. It was a very weak bill. Um, it carved out broad exemptions for government functions and powers um, and other exemptions, which some of the panelists might be reflecting on, so I won't go into a lot of detail. Um, but at the time, um, because these human rights treaty bodies had told the Hong Kong government they needed to introduce legislation that complied with their international human rights obligations, um, a delegation went back to Geneva and told the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination that Hong Kong had introduced this bill, but that it was terrible, <laughs> it didn't comply with its, with its obligations, um, and asked the committee to put some pressure on the Hong Kong government. And the committee did issue a letter to the Chinese, um, the head of the Chinese uh, government delegation in Geneva, the UN, the Chinese UN representative in Geneva, and asked for their overdue report <laughs> to the committee, um, which did put enough, and asked them to include information in that report about the situation in Hong Kong and what this legislation was all about. Um, and that triggered the Chinese government to submit the report, append a separate report prepared by the Hong Kong government on the race discrimination ordinance, and at the time it had already been enacted um, in Hong Kong. Um, and then the committee reviewed the, that report in August 2009. Um, I was there for that review. Um, and then they issued concluding observations again, made some recommendations about how to improve the race discrimination ordinance. Um, and then we went back again for the next review in August of 2018, as I mentioned. Um, and this, um, at that point, not much had happened. Actually. It's fair to say nothing had happened. Is that fair to say? That's <laughs> basically nothing. So there had not been any real um, substantive amendments to the race discrimination ordinance between 2009 and then the review of Hong Kong's report in 2018. Um, so we went back to Geneva. We explained this, these issues and other issues related to ethnic minorities and racial discrimination in Hong Kong. Um, to the committee and said, Hong Kong still has not um, adopted the recommendations that, that you made. And so they issued new concluding observations and now we have those concluding observations and the question is, what do we, what do, we do next? Like how, how do we use these materials um, produced by this international human rights committee um, the process um, and is it effective? Given that there were no changes between 2009 and 2018, are we, um, are we wasting our time? <laughs> is there value? And if there is value, what value does this process have? Um, and for civil society advocates in particular, how do we bring these recommendations back 
to the local context and use them in discussions with the government? And how much of an impact does that actually have? Um, so these are the kinds of questions that we'll be exploring. We'll look at some of the specific issues that were raised by the committee, um, but also these broader um, concerns or questions about effectiveness and impact and, and what, what do we do next. Um, so with that bit of background, um, I, I'll introduce each of the panelists and then ask them to speak just for a few minutes, and then we'll have a more informal um, discussion, and I'll, I'll open it up to the floor also for questions and comments from all of you. Um, well, first, on directly um, on my left, we have Claudia Yip, and uh, unfortunately, La Yip Kai, who's director of Hong Kong Human Rights Monitor, was supposed to be here, but unfortunately hurt himself, um, and Claudia has very kindly, just at the very last minute, <laughs> agreed, agreed to step in, um, and we're very grateful to her. Um, but Claudia is, is a member of Hong Kong Human Rights Monitor, and she's authored and edited um, a number of human rights reports in Hong Kong, um, and was a very active member of the delegation in Geneva in August. Um, next to her is um, Emily, Emily Lau, who um, really needs no introduction, I think, but um, she was a member of, of, of the Hong Kong Legislative Council um, for a long time, was the first woman directly elected to LegCo, um, and she was also the chairperson of the Democratic Party from 2012 to 2016. She has numerous awards, uh, received numerous awards, which again, is they're too detailed to, to go through at this at this time. Um, but before her political career, she worked as a journalist and was a university lecturer. She was chairperson of the Hong Kong Journalist Association for two years, 1989 to 1991. Um, and her trip to Geneva in August um, marked her, the 30th anniversary of her participation in the treaty body reporting processes at the United Nations. So she really has a, a wealth of experience with these various processes, and I'm sure has a lot of interesting reflections, broader, broader reflections about the effectiveness that they actually have. Um, and next to her is Pooja Kapai, who's associate professor in the law faculty. She's done extensive research on the rights of ethnic minorities in Hong Kong, um, and she's a previous director of the Center for Comparative and Public Law and is now the convener of the Women's Studies Research Center at Hong Kong U. Um, and next to her is Phyllis Jung, who is the executive director of Hong Kong Unison, which is a leading local NGO um, that upholds racial equality and the rights of ethnic minorities in Hong Kong, um, and in particular advocates for equitable education for minorities. So with those introductions, um, I guess I would like to invite um, Emily to speak first, is that all right? Um, okay, so, and she's, Emily has instructed me to ding the bell. <laughs> I'm giving each of you five minutes. Um, so if I, I hate to do that, and I'm sure you all stick within time, so I don't have to, but um, if you hear the bell dinging, that's why. Okay, Emily? Thank you very much, Kelly, and uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, it's, uh, it's very good of Kelly to organize this uh, occasion for us to discuss the uh, uh, the implementation of the convention, uh, particularly after we came back from uh, Geneva in August, I don't think we've had an occasion to sit together to discuss it. So it's a, it's a good time to talk about it. And in fact, I think we have uh, requested a meeting with the administration to talk about it, maybe Phyllis when she speaks, because she's responsible for organizing that meeting. Maybe that meeting is not going to happen. <laughs> so, so I think we will have to call a press conference. Uh, and that's a problem. You know, we, we, we spend our own money, our time to travel to uh, the United Nations to talk about Hong Kong problems. And in fact, I mean, there was an army of Hong Kong officials there. And they were there, part of the Chinese delegation. And Kelly talked about me first started going there in uh, 1988. <laughs> That's before some of you were born. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and as Chris Patton called me, I'm a headbanger. <laughs> Just kept headbanging my head against the wall. And some people would say, why the, why the hell do you bother after 30 years? And uh, I stepped down from the Legislative Council in 2016. 
And in fact, I was in Geneva twice this year, August for the uh, third hearing, and again October for the lobbying of the China UPR hearing, which is the Universal Periodic Review. So this shows that I think it is an important process. And it's a process where Hong Kong is discussed on the international stage. And Beijing cannot accuse you of going there to badmouth them <laughs> because they are party to the whole proceeding. Whereas if you go elsewhere, <laughs> then they say, oh, you always go abroad to badmouth China and badmouth Hong Kong, which I think is crazy. We go and give a shadow report to comment on the implementation of the convention or the general human rights situation in Hong Kong and China. What's wrong with that? I just came back from Japan talking about human rights, the situation of the human rights lawyers. And the Japanese asked me, oh, if we Japanese comment on China's human rights lawyers, uh, would they accuse us of interfering in China's internal affairs? I said they would. But they're wrong, because human rights knows no boundaries. If there are human rights violations in Japan, in America, in China, in Myanmar, and elsewhere, we all have a duty to speak out. And does the government care? Of course it does. First of all, many of their reports to the UN committees, they are on time. But when I was in Geneva in October, some of the UN people complain that the report to the uh, Human Rights Committee on the ICCPR is not on time now. So we are pressing the, the government. And they, they file a very th thick report, although we have many c comments on them, but they try. And after the third committee issued their recommendations, they came up with a five, six page response saying the committee said this, we say this. So they do try to take it, I think, take it more seriously than many governments. But why is it that doesn't have that much impact, as some of them will tell you? And why is it that <laughs> there are not too many people here? I'm not blaming Kelly. One reason is the mass media. We were there, so many of us. Was there a journalist there? Zero. Many years ago, journalists told me, Ms. Lau, human rights is a box office poison. Why, should, why the hell should we cover it? I know when the day you are in jail, you are being locked up, deprived of your human rights and civil liberties. Then you know it's important. But of course, by then it's too late. So, my dear friends, thank you for being here. My time is running out. I think it is important. I've been there for 30 years. I will continue to do it, and of course, I hope more people will do it, not just university professors or NGOs. The news media should pay attention, and all of us should pay attention, not just when people are being rounded up, <laughs> locked up, tortured, and then you pay attention. Well, it's a, it's a bloody late, so, but still, <laughs> better late than never. So thank you very, very much, Kelly. And uh, I hope that uh, I get you fired up and you can ask some questions and give some comments. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, Phyllis? Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm from Hong Kong Unison. We're a local NGO fighting for the uh, rights of ethnic minorities, and we focus um, mostly on education. Um, this is not the first time Unison has been to um, these UN conventions. Actually, it's, I, I think it's our second, second time. This is only our third report from Hong Kong. But as Kelly mentioned, the second time um, after the, uh, the hearing, uh, we were able to push the Hong Kong government to, um, to enact the race discrimination ordinance, although it is a very lousy and very weak um, ordinance. And it's true that nothing has taken place since the 10 years um, since 20, 20, zero eight, uh, 2008, although we have asked to push a lot of things. And actually, if we look at um, the concluding observations of uh, the, the, this, this report and this hearing, there, has, there is nothing much new about it. And we're very disappointed that the government has not taken you know, the recommendations and the concluding observations from the committee um, in, in like 10 years ago. 
And to add to that, this report has been late. Um, there, is a, there should be a cycle of four years, right? Or four years. I think now for it's, it's two. two. Now but it's two. I, I, maybe I'm wrong about that. Yeah. Every, every two years, you think? So anyway, um, after 2008, it's either a cycle of two or four years that the government has to submit their reports. But our government has been delayed, and not until last year, uh, 2018, that, I mean this year, we're still in 2018, that they submitted the report. Um, but we had to do a lot of lobbying um, to the committee because the committee would received, you know, thick reports from the government and they received different reports from civil societies like ourselves and universities and also individuals. Um, we had a group of ethnic minority youth who submitted the comments on how the government is implementing the ICERT. So they have a lot to do and we have to lobby them and tell them what are the important issues. But I was glad that actually um, the committee picked up um, race, um, racist hate speech. Um, this is something that at us as an organization and also um, people who are you know, of different ethnicities face on social media. And it was, it was good. To, I think it's because of the global climate as well. But the committee was able to pick it up. And I'm not sure if it's because of the committee, the EOC, the Equal Opportunities Commission, actually have been dealing with um, these racist hate speech um, quite actively um, since earlier this month. So I think there, there is something to do with the government because the government doesn't want to be shamed. And as well, at this um, at this uh, convention, at this meeting, the committee also noticed that EOC is a grade C, um, was given a grade C, which is the lowest of all grades in compliance to the Paris principles. And the EOC again has issued, you know, press release talking about this. And actually, this is not a new thing. The, the, the first time EOC submitted their rating was in 2001, and they got a grade C, and they never resubmit for rating again. But it was... We, I find this committee is really good that they picked up, you know, all these points. And also working with civil societies, um, this was particularly mentioned by the committee that the government should work with the civil societies. Although the government has made public consultations on writing the third report, but none of our comments were actually included. So it was merely formality that they did. Um, so if they had included our comments in the report, probably the committee did not have to read so many reports and um, get, a, get a real picture of how the situation is in Hong Kong implementing the, the ICERT, the convention. But, um, but they didn't because the report that they submitted was exactly what you know, they had planned and none of our um, observations or none of our um, recommendations uh, and observations were included in the government's report. So the committee in this way, they they especially ask for, you know, uh, working with civil societies. And I hope the government will take this recommendation because um, we are here to help people and to protect human rights. And with the, then they, they should also really work with civil societies to promote human rights in Hong Kong. As Emily said, people don't care about human rights. <laughs> it's um, when we talk about education, um, it's actually a basic right. But um, people seem to think it's, they're okay, they get school, but we're not only looking for a school for you know, ethnic minority children. We're looking for an equitable education, which is really basic human rights. Thank you. Um, Pucha? Thanks, Kelly, and uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to sit next to the woman who's done 30 years of this <laughs> and to continue to be inspired. Uh, and I hope that we will continue to have the opportunity, Emily, um, to, to hear from you and learn from you because there's really much learning there. So thank you so much. Um, I wanted to take a slightly different perspective, um, perhaps a somewhat more personal one than I would otherwise uh, as an academic. Um, for me, I think that the process has been... Uh, quite an awakening as to the power and impact um, of human rights advocacy and how each of us has a, a very uh, important role to play. And I think that although we're using the phrase human rights broadly, it's very important to bear in mind that we're talking about um, the rights of uh, ethnic minorities or racial minorities, national minorities, the groups uh, that typically um, are... Uh, those that are the voices that are most ignored 
uh, in society, or they often feature at the very lowest rungs of this hierarchy of priority issues that every society has to contend with. And of course, when we're faced with uh, major challenges ranging from uh, climate change to uh, you know, the economic downturn, poverty, um, and other socioeconomic inequalities, we often forget that some of the most mar marginalized communities are actually those people who are living life at the intersection of multiple marginalities. And I think that the committee does a great job of highlighting how um, situations of inequality pertaining to education or poverty uh, or you know, being a, of a different gender or sexual orientation actually exacerbate those circumstances when you belong to a minority group such as a racial or ethnic minority. Uh, and in that sense, I think for me, um, the journey to CERD really came as a result of being a member of Hong Kong Unison. Uh, so oddly enough, it took Unison's sort of prompting to say, hey, Pooja, why don't you get involved and why don't you come along? And I thought, me? Right? And this is one of the things that I've reflected on extensively because for members of my community, when, uh, when we talk about human rights issues, you know, the response often is, well, uh, why? Why should we care? I mean, we're well-to-do, or they're well-to-do, um, right? Uh, but I think back to the struggles that we had growing up in Hong Kong, and I never quite understood uh, at the time that I was living a life that was very different to many of my uh, Chinese peers in Hong Kong. And for, uh, for many of my contemporaries, we'd actually never really crossed paths with other Chinese students. Uh, and coming to the university was really eye-opening because I remember in my first class, a student complimented me for how well I spoke English without an <laughs> accent. Uh, and that really drives home the reality that for many Hong Kong students, that continues to be uh, sort of the Hong Kong that they, that they see. And we're not woven into it uh, as intricately as they are, even though many of us have been here for three or four generations. And so I think that it's very important for us to recognize our own power and the voices that we carry. And with sort of um, Unison, I started out not by going to the CERD, but actually attending the Human Rights Committee's hearing on Hong Kong's performance under the ICCPR, where we first raised the issue of the lack of Chinese as a second language uh, policy. Uh, and it was uh, later that year again in 2013, uh, where we attended the Children's Rights Committee hearing, again, raising the same issue of how ethnic minority children are disadvantaged in Hong Kong. And in 2014, in January, um, a change of policy was announced by Siwa Leung, who was then chief executive, who said that there will no longer be designated schooling for ethnic minority children. So I think that there is still some uh, leverage to be had out of international processes. And for me, I think, again, being a part of that and being sort of the face um, and the voice to be able to say, circumstances in Hong Kong do not put me in an equal position with my peers, and I think that that needs to change. And then to seeing that materialize first in the form of policy, and then, of course, there comes the implementation of policy, which is, I think, the place where we're all still uh, working hard to, to sort of see change. Another important thing that... Um, I think has emerged is this push towards greater transparency and the call for data and statistics. So in 2015, I published the first um, Status of Ethnic Minorities in Hong Kong report, uh, which looked at post-1997 uh, figures pertaining to the performance of ethnic minorities under a range of areas. And this sort of gave issues a different kind of visibility and really highlighted how particular uh, ethnic groups, not just ethnic minorities as a whole, but particular ethnic groups were underperforming across a range of spheres. And it is that um, facet that I think that the committee uniquely highlights um, throughout its uh, reports in Hong Kong, uh, on Hong Kong rather. So it looks at poverty, um, racism, education, employment, trafficking, refugees, foreign domestic helpers, foreign, uh, the children of foreign domestic helpers as well. Um, so overall, you can see that this committee has a very multidimensional approach to considering the different inequalities faced by ethnic minorities. And so it's uniquely placed to target and make um, concluding observations which are rich enough 
for us to use here uh, to go back to the government and say, this is your report card, this is the review, here is a long list of things to work through. And of course, as the government does as it does, which is it'll, you know, as Emily said, it'll write its report. And oftentimes, it's a lot of rep rep repetitiveness. We've heard these words before. They said it at the UN. They say it here. And there are lots of gaps where the issues that have been raised aren't directly addressed or covered. And that's where I think different groups uh, working together really matters. Uh, and I'll just uh, end on, on a note that even as an academic, when I started out um, bringing, so in my role as uh, former director of CCPL, we brought together civil society organizations to do some sort of training on the conventions and then to write um, our submissions and put the report together so that we could submit it as a joint report so the committee would only read one rather than several, or they could read the several but also see this as sort of a comprehensive guide to the issues in Hong Kong. And there is so much that I learned from our civil society partners on the ground because they have access to um, the real uh, lived realities, right, of, of the cases and the stories stories of the clients who come to see them or the members of their communities and organizations. Uh, we have a more distanced perspective, but then we have a different expertise of how that fits then into the model of the convention. And working together is the only way that we, uh, I think uh, we've managed to have the kind of impact at the committee level. Uh, and it's been a very successful year, I think, where the committee picked up out of our joint report every issue that we raised except for one. Um, and that's on violence against women, right? But that has featured in a previous report. But I think that that uh, speaks volumes about the strength of working together um, so that we make sure that when we are advocating for ethnic minorities, we don't exclude other groups um, who are also ethnic minorities but um, are facing other forms of discrimination too. And I, and I really feel it's been a, a, a process of learning from uh, different uh, organizations and uh, civil society actors. Thank you, Pooja. Um, Claudia? Hi, everyone. Um, it's been uh, my honor to have uh, um, joined this um, journey with these learned women. I, uh, I joined the uh, Human Rights Monitor in 2014, just in time for the Umbrella Movement. And we went to the Committee Against Torture to... Um, um, so we... Um, that, that was my first um, participation in UN treaty body uh, processes. And um, I would say um, it's quite, how do you say, quite frustrating and disappointing um, how, no matter how much we do as civil society, we, for example, in, the, in August, we camped in Geneva, worked round the clock, providing most updated, most accurate information to the committee members to raise questions, to raise issues with the government's delegation so that the government delegation would know that, hey, the UN committee knows you have a problem at home, you, uh, how are you going to address it? But the government, they just didn't answer their questions. Um, that uh, hearing took part on uh, happened to take part on um, a Friday and a Monday, so questions were asked on Friday, and the government delegation supposed to had the weekend to prepare for answers, and they should come back on Monday and provide answers orally, and then the committee members should have been able to follow up and. That, that would that would be what I call a constructive dialogue, but instead the government um, just mumbled a few lines and then say, "Hey, we have prepared a written answer, and it's like this this thick, and um, here it is." Um, and then we looked at that written answer is um, response to a list of issues, which is a document issued by the committee in April. Um, so it's not even in an indirect response to the questions raised by the committee on Friday in the hearing. Um, after we, civil society, have uh, been preparing the committee members to, to ask. Um, and the government's uh, explanation is that, uh, oh, I think all these, uh, uh, what we have prepared for the list of issues already covered uh, the committee's questions, but no. Um, one, for example, um, the committee members very 
correctly pointed out that why um, that's the Palermo protocol on uh, human trafficking does not apply to Hong Kong. Um, is there a need to have uh, legislation uh, on and on a uh, comprehensive legislation to criminalize all forms of human trafficking in Hong Kong? And the government did not answer that in the in the hearing and in the in the very thick um, written answer. You 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 would. Um, expect them to say we have done so much but the, instead they have in, including those answers they have a table of a uh, number of crimes and they are like um, the number of murder cases number of uh, um, like um, number of crimes that might include uh, those related to human trafficking, but not all. So why are you putting it there? It's like we, okay, at the, at, at the hearing, I say, I have given you the written answer, go read it. But in fact, that written answer is not even answer. So it's, um, it's just an example of saying how how the government's attitude towards this report um, process is according to Mr. Law, is getting worse. In the past, um, maybe Emily can um, verify, in the past, it, it was higher ranking um, government officials attending these hearings. Um, but now we have um, lower ranking people going there and not answering questions. Also, because these hearing is, uh, the, these hearings are conducted in conjunction with China, and Chinese government would take up all the time and they would just sideline Hong Kong government. And for example, in the third hearing, um, the Chinese government was going to close the conference without giving the time to the Hong Kong government to reply to uh, committee members' questions. And of course, the Hong Kong government representatives did not fight for their chance to speak. It was only when committee members said, hey, the Hong Kong government hasn't uh, replied yet, then the Hong Kong government uh, said something and then say, we also prepared a written answer. So... Um, <clears throat> And also the government would um, would um, adopt the Chinese style of responding to challenges or criticisms from international bodies, say, uh, the, the, your accusations are not true, um, and these are our internal matters, et cetera. Um, for example, in the UPR um, last month, um, Matthew Jiang basically flew to Geneva to say, oh, your accusation that Hong Kong's uh, freedom of... Uh, freedom of the press are not true. <laughs> um, but I would, um, so the government's attitude, they are, while Emily said um, the government seems to be taking um, the reporting process serious, yes, in some, some way, but also we are seeing it, um, finding ways to slack. Um, so it, it will be our role as civil society and also urging um, the media to pay more attention to the issue so that the government can, would have the sense that it cannot, cannot um, say, up here, so um, take, um, take the process so not serious. But on a positive note, I want to um, add that uh, actually in these um, past uh, treaty body pro uh, reporting processes, we have achieved some uh, achievements. So, like using the um, term from uh, the estab establishment camp, we have done a number of sengong zhangchou. Like, for example, um, in the previous uh, committee against torture um, hearing, um, after that, we uh, the police uh, uh, changed its policy regarding body searches, so it stopped uh, randomly doing uh, strip searches on detainees. And also, um, previously, we do not have any uh, independent screening, uh, screening of refugees, uh, non refugee claimants in Hong Kong. It was all done by the uh, UN High Commission of, on Refugees. And then, um, because government said something in the UN, and then Hong Kong lawyers used that in court, and then we have the Prabhaka case. And Hong Kong government had to, um, because of that judicial review decision, Hong Kong government had to do its own screening. And also um, the RDO, as mentioned by Kelly, and um, 
and also um, international pressure, including UN, they, they also have some impact on Hong Kong's policy on other areas of human uh, rights. For example, human trafficking. Hong Kong government has been denying the uh, existence of this problem in Hong Kong. And um, after the UN has mentioned it seven times in different treaty bodies and also other uh, international reports on human trafficking, it starts to do something, but not Enough, of course, but it starts to do something, and also my, on migrant domestic workers issues. So these processes, um, a little impact at least, would be to put issues that are originally not on Hong Kong government's agenda, not on its priority, to at least um, is, it would be seen and it would be taken care of. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Claudia. Thank. Thank. All of you. Um, I mean, Emily and all of you have pointed out. Okay, the government does seem to care, right? So they. So this process, this, these international bodies, the pressure that is placed on the Hong Kong government does seem to to make some difference. And I have noticed that the Hong Kong government they like to go back to the treaty bodies and say, "Oh yes, we've done something." Okay, they might pick up on one recommendation in the concluding observations or maybe a little bit of a recommendation and, and, and look like they've made, try to make themselves look like they've made some sort of progress. And you've raised some good examples of what kind of impact the third process has had in particular. Um, Claudia has also expressed some frustrations <laughs> with, with the process. Um, but this, I think this discussion begs the question now about, it's a strategic question. So, what have you learned? I mean, through all of the well, through 30 years in Emily's case, and um, through the even the the third process in August about how to approach, say, advocacy at the international level, but also at the domestic level. How do we get the media more interested? Um, so, what? What do you think? I mean, what do you think might work? What are the sort of trigger points? Or are there certain issues that will resonate more um, with the Hong Kong government than other, other issues? Maybe we could, if each of you could answer that, um, starting with Phyllis, okay. Emily reminded me that I should tell you about, um, we actually requested to meet with the government on the, um, the, the third um, meeting, but um, the um, chief executive herself already said she's too busy and she cannot accommodate any time for us, and referred us to, um, to the secretary of CMAB, uh, Mr. Patrick Nip, and we haven't heard from them yet, so, yeah. <laughs> do you um, think it's, do you, sorry, can I ask, do you think it's likely that such a meeting will take place? I mean, you sound skeptical. <laughs> I'm not sure if they would meet with us, but I hope when they meet with us, it's not going to be just a token saying that, okay, we've met, we've, we've received your comments, now what? You know, because that's exactly what the committee was, was saying. They, they did things out of formality, but they never followed up with um, the civil society's recommendations or observations and the issues that they brought out. So I hope this is not just a meeting, meeting, but they really would go back and, and for example, amend the laws and um, do better stuff for, from different bureaus. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, um, the effectiveness, I think not many people were very interested in, we've, we've held press conferences and, you know, uh, before and after the, the trip to um, Geneva, but we feel that press is not that interested. But what Unison felt is with the comments from an international human um, treaty body, it adds substance to what we say to them that, see, look, um, even the human rights, even, you know, CERD in Geneva also criticizes on, for example, um, the lack of support in uh, Chinese education for ethnic minorities, the racial segregation, the hate speech, so on and so forth. So we can use that and say and make, make it a stronger point. And that's how I felt that, 
you know, then media or reporters would say, oh, yeah, has, has that been discussed too? Really? That was mentioned? You know, because they, they wouldn't follow the concluding observations of CERT. Um, the reporters would not have all that time to do that. But if we remind them, you know, actually international human rights conventions also, also criticizes, you know, the Hong Kong government on cer certain stuff. And this really adds some, um, you know, some substance to their reporting. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, there's definitely the dimension that uh, you suddenly have an authority where uh, the government has been called out. And at least in my case, I found um, initially in 2013, when we met with government officials, they would often say there's no race discrimination problem or the statistics or um, the experiences you describe, they're not racism. There are sort of class-based, uh, you know, issues or misunderstandings between people. Um, whereas after the committee has pointed out that there is something, or we've, you know, uh, it's reiterated what we've said, that there's something structural or systemic about the patterns that ethnic minorities experience in Hong Kong, then the government sort of sits up and takes notice and takes the matter more seriously. And I think that um, repetition on our part is also important. So we're criticizing the government for repeating um, their position in different documents. But I think we could learn from that because what we have started to do now, I think, is whenever there is consultations with civil societies, whether it's in LegCo or or, you know, meetings on the chief executive's policy address. I mean, one of the issues that I know Unison has constantly raised, and I've certainly raised again and again, is the reform of the race discrimination ordinance, because it's been um, nine years since the committee made its observations on the deficiencies, and the question is, well, what are you going to do to amend those? And at least um, for now, we have the uh, Secretary for Constitutional Mainland Affairs Bureau finally saying yes, we are working on it. We don't have a specific timetable for you, but we are aware of the deficiencies and we're working on it. So I think that there is some merit in not letting go because part of that is also the strategy, right? If you keep ignoring a certain issue, the government might hope that will go away. But as Emily's a testament, you should never go away until you can keep on because um, there, you might only make uh, a little progress each time. But step by step is okay too. Because, I mean, at least as an ethnic minority, we've seen a wave of change in the receptivity towards the idea that there might be racial discrimination that is operative in Hong Kong. And, and for me, that's really, really significant considering the discourse in the early 2000s and late 1990s where there was an absolute denial that this was happening. So hopefully we can um, better strategize um, and really sort of um, highlight practical measures that the government can take so that when those things are done or not done or not done well enough, we can actually measure the effectiveness um, rather than using sort of broad recommendations. So I think that's some learning for me, at least, from, um, from engaging in these processes. Emily? I think it was last year or the, after I stepped down from LegCo, I was invited by the UN development program to go to Myanmar to talk to their newly elected members of parliament of Aung San Suu Kyi's party. And I said to them, to be effective, you have to be like a dog biting into a bone and would not let go. Oh, they were so excited. <laughs> Nobody's ever told MPs that they should be like a dog. I think on many things, you have to be. When you approach government officials, and you must understand that many people approach them every day, and why on earth would they want to respond to you, take you seriously? So the trick is, how do you get people to take you seriously? Out of the 100 calls they get a day, why is your call so important? What you need to let them know is, I mean business, and if I approach you and if you don't respond positively, there could be consequences. Well, how do you get that message across is the challenge on us. But if you don't do that, <laughs> you will be cast aside. So I think we have to reflect. And the thing is, how much time and energy do you have because you have other things that you want to do. So you've done this and that's it. You, can, you go on to other things. And the government is so happy because you probably never come back. 
So it's a question of priority, tenacity, and all that. And then, of course, on the 16th of November, I was invited to the inauguration ceremony of the Federation of Hong Kong Ethnic Communities. And Phyllis was there too. So they set up this ethnic community federation. And they mentioned, of course, the $500 million that's uh, been earmarked in the budget. So there are people, there's money. So things ought to happen. So the trick is on us. And so I think we should ac approach this federation. I know the guy who, inv who invited me there, Mr. Mohan Chukani. Uh, he's the uh, uncle of Michael Chukani on TVB. So I think we should approach them, we should approach the government, but we should approach them in such a forceful way that it's difficult for them to say no. Because otherwise, we come back in two years' time, Kelly, I don't know, when you've been promoted, you won't hold this again. And it's the same thing. You see what I mean? So there are ways and ways of doing things. And we, we have to ask ourselves, how much are we prepared and our organization prepared to go for it. Maybe some say, well, don't, don't do that. We just do it nicely. <laughs> there are many people who do things nicely. I mean, I don't know where they end up. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Claudia? Right. Um, rightly pointed out by the, by, um, the other ladies, uh, not letting the issues go, keep, um, keep biting. Oh, keep chewing on the bone. Um, also, also, we uh, ought to engage with um, international, like, I, I should say it this way. Um, the UN is only one of our platform of advocacy, and also their recommendations, their concluding observations, or, or their general comments uh, issued by each committee, they are our tools. We can wave them at the government and say, these are the international standards, so stop bullying us, like, for example, um, in, the, um, in, the, in, the, in the political reform, the Chinese government is saying that what they are proposing is true um, universal suffrage, and we say, no, there is international standard of universal suffrage, and st so stop saying, so stop changing the definitions of everything and saying everything is fine. So we use these concluding observations, we use these general comments um, as international standard, and we stick by them, and, and, and try to stick it to the government and say, you have to achieve these you cannot achieve less, and um, so international engaging international um, community other than UN might be also helpful because they um, UN treaty bodies only happen once in a while, and um, for example, also taking the example of um, human trafficking, they. Um, there are a number of international reports about human trafficking around the world, for example, the U.S. State Department's one and also um, um, slavery index. Um, so it's useful to um, advocate to them and to group everything together and say to the government, hey, the U.S. has ranked Hong Kong on tier two watch list for two years already, and uh, the U.N. has recommended seven times to the Hong Kong government that there should be a comprehensive legislation. So in the end, perhaps all these, um, all these pressure in together can cause some change. I don't know. I cannot guarantee. Um, but uh, also... Other than like um, these kind of advocacy, we can also bring the um, court cases. That's very um, expensive and also very difficult, but we have seen uh, in, uh, human rights improvements achieved in the past uh, through courts. So that could be one of the ways. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, have you? experienced, I mean, in any of these activities, um, I mean, Hong Kong does seem quite responsive to international pressure and in the various ways that you've pointed out. Um, but have you ever, have you experienced any pushback on, well, Hong Kong is different. It's um, perhaps culturally, um, politically, economically, and we don't want the outside world to tell us what to do. Um, in a sort of relativistic way. I mean, have you experienced any of that in 
these activities that you you feel like there's becoming more sort of pushback that Hong Kong is is unique. Um, international human rights law is sort of a Western um, import, um, and it's not necessarily relevant. Or is that something that really hasn't hasn't come up at all in these discussions? I I don't recall that uh, that much. The only only exception is the uh, Refugee Convention, which again is you know included because this issue came up. Apart, because then they say Hong Kong is unique. Hong Kong has its problem, and uh, many treaty bodies have asked the government to uh, sign up to the Refugee Convention, and they kept resisting. And, uh, but uh, but uh, and it's not a cultural thing. They just think well, we're unique, we're so small, we have such a long coastline, and it's very easy for all these illegal people to come. So I, I think that's the only one. On, uh, maybe the others can chip in. But in my experience, I have never heard of them saying, oh, we are unique and, and maybe China. Actually, I, I must say, I must confess, I do not pay that much more close attention to the hearing on China. But even with the Chinese officials, the fact that they actually go to the UN, it's very difficult for them to be sitting there and then say, oh, well, you know, we have our way of doing things. And if I were a committee member and say, why the hell are you here? Then you sign up to the convention. So even for the Chinese government, they, they just don't do the, what they want, but they would not use that as an excuse. I don't know whether any of you recall any experience. Um, I feel the government does, does respect um, international human rights treaties. Uh, Individual countries may be different, but I don't think they they they, they would go against or um, or refute against these recommendations from international human rights uh, treaty bodies. That's that's just my impression. Rather than you know, um, it's ngoi guo sai like it's it's um, f um, influence from other countries. Um, usually, when UN makes the recommendations, they they don't criticize them as this is my my territory. This is this is under my jurisdiction. You guys have no, you know, no place to, to interfere. I, I don't, I don't get that impression. Yeah. My impression has been that it's not that they consider the standards not to apply, but I do think that there is a feeling that what is, the view is that what is happening in Hong Kong vis-a-vis -vis ethnic minorities or our policies on asylum seekers. It's not governed by racism because they think racism is what we see in the West, in the U.S., right? So the counterpoint that is always made as well, how many black people, you know, do you see dying in Hong Kong? Do we have racist violence? Look at what's happening in this country and that. Uh, or, you know, you want to talk about uh, racial vilification or hate speech. Look at this and that. So I think there's this tendency to compare and uh, to sort of compare downwards. So you look at the worst possible candidate and say, look at us. We're up here. We're quite a safe um, community. So there's a difference in their perception of racism. And somehow, and I think there is definitely, uh, I mean, Race is constructed differently in Asia and in Hong Kong. So I think that reality is there. But this um, argument, therefore, that because our, I mean, it's sort of like an Olympics of oppression, isn't it? You know, you're competing to see who's worse and who's better. Uh, you know, what is, the, what is light touch racism versus heart touch? So there's that. Uh, I was trying to make the same point as Pooja had. Uh, when I was doing a radio um, program about um, policing, um, policing the 1st of July, March, mm. and uh, uh, an audience called and said, no, but uh, uh, the Hong Kong police hasn't shot anybody yet. Mm. Go monitor police powers in the States. <laughs> Why I leave Hong Kong alone? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, they, they, there is this kind of um, thinking that uh, Hong Kong situation is not worse. So why are you talking about human rights? Are you going, uh, are you trying to cause troubles? Mm. And so I, I think this kind of thinking exists among some people, but um, mm, I hope it's not majority. I'd like to allow enough time for audience participation. So does anybody have any questions or comments that they'd like to make? <laughs> oh, 
Okay, one, two, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, just you have to push the button. Thank you. And if you could introduce yourself briefly. Okay. Hi. Uh, I'm Robert Godden, uh, formerly with Amnesty International for 14 years and now Director at Rights Exposure. Um, it's very interesting, and I'm most interested in the strategic approach and the utility of using UN mechanisms. Um, first of all, one of the things that uh, I think uh, comes across is where does this particular intervention using CERD, reporting to it, fit within a, a holistic strategy? Because using just one intervention very rarely succeeds, even with a, a government that is susceptible to criticism within the UN. So that's one question. How does this fit in with a broader strategy uh, to get things like the racial discrimination ordinance amended, etc.? Second thing is, is the media was mentioned a couple of times here, and I think Emily mentioned the failure for any journalists to actually show up at the hearing, and reporting on these issues is relatively weak. It strikes me that you need to win that communications battle in order for interventions like at the UN to be effective. I don't mean this in any derogatory way, but the UN said, Racial discrimination audience are boring stories for most people. It's esoteric. Most people don't understand even what they are. You need to win using stories which people connect with. And it's an internal matter. You need to make it a local matter in that sense. So there is utility in going to international mechanisms. And we've seen that through using the trafficking in persons report uh, on migrant domestic workers. That's been very effective, I think. Uh, but at the same time, you need to have parallel soft power initiatives which support those type of interventions. So my question would be, sort of what, how does this, what the work you've done in reporting to CERD, uh, fit within a broader strategy? Okay. Thank you. Okay, Mark? Uh, I'm Mark Sheldon from Chinese University. Um, my question is about the UN process itself, and perhaps Emily can best answer this over her long experience there. But there's a lot of uh, literature in the human rights literature about how the nature of the UN human rights process has changed, how it's been, in a sense, co-opted or corralled by states that are not very amenable to human rights protections. So, so my question is, did you, have you experienced that? I mean, are there now adversaries who are part of the process who are not friendly to human rights concerns and to the normal understanding of the human rights regime? Um, and did you find allies in other places, particularly special reporters or staff of the UN mechanism? Because it, it seems to me, just looking at it from the outside, that the human rights process itself has become corroded or corrupted. I think that also relates back to the previous question about a holistic strategy, so looking at other mechanisms like special rapporteurs or looking at the system more broadly. Um, one more question and then we'll have each of the panelists res respond. Okay, no? Okay. Pooja? All right, um, so in terms of um, strategy, Rob, I mean, I think that it's, uh, I, I definitely agree with you that there have to be parallel um, efforts made, and I think for our part as an academic institution, so formerly in my role um, as director, but also I think with Kelly working on CRPD, um, we've worked on CEDAW and the CRC and Human Rights Committee and now the CERD, CAT. So there have been multiple um, avenues for us to try to generate civil society momentum and um, highlight key issues. There are certain issues, for example, the overall political and human rights climate in Hong Kong that have been prominent features for every, uh, every report that we've made um, over the years now. Um, and then these serve as the foundation for arguing whether some um, sets of rights are, uh, are better protected or better implemented versus others. Um, so in a way, we could say that we're starting to build up sort of that infrastructure where we're having people do engagement um, in the civil society and then jointly with us 
and then trying to leverage every possible avenue in terms of the treaty monitoring processes. At the same time, however, I think we've also recognized it's really important to use our resources, our limited resources well. So not everybody can travel to the UN at every occasion. And on that front, I, you know, I have to say that the committee, and this sort of touches a bit on Mark's question as well, the committee members have been very amenable. There are also civil society organizations on the ground in Geneva, which have been very helpful in... Um, offering training and assistance and insights into particular um, issues that are on the radar of the committee or that they would like more information on X, Y, and Z. Um, we also um, engage with consular corps in Hong Kong representing different countries, and they often ask us from time to time, you know, what's the temperature like on these issues? And so I think that um, there is a, an across-the-board uh, engagement that is ongoing. What I think is lacking, however, is sort of the angle that you, you highlighted in terms of what's a good media story. Because with these groups being some of the more vulnerable groups that we're dealing with, or in every treaty reporting process, I think you have those, um, well, some may be willing to be very vocal about what has specifically happened to them, but I think in the case of ethnic minorities or certain domestic workers, uh, there may not necessarily be the same courage or, um, I think, capacity to be able to withstand the pressure that comes with becoming sort of the face of a problem in a particular society. And I certainly know with the ethnic minority community, there's a great reluctance because of the stigma uh, attached. And so the question is, how do you win the communication war without engaging in the kind of sensationalism that the media covets and courts so regularly? Uh, and I personally struggle with that a lot because, of course, we know what kind of stories would um, make for a good headline. But at the same time, that also says something about media consumerism and how we're feeding certain stereotypes. Um, so it really comes down to being able to identify the human side of a story and find a compelling angle which a, an ethical reporter, someone who understands the value of the story uh, and then can help um, put it in the right perspective and do a fair and balanced report on it so that people don't write it off, as Claudia said, you know, by saying, oh, you know, you're blowing this out of proportion. Hong Kong is doing much better than other countries. But at the same time, not downplaying it too much so that the media says, well, my editor won't bite. And that's one of the challenges that I've had. A lot of reporters will say to us, well, I think the story is compelling, but between you and me, my senior editor is not going to have it because the headline just isn't catchy. You know, there's nothing here. Can you give me anything more, right? So that's one challenge. And you, I think, or Emily even, and others in the room, maybe you have better ideas on what might be um, a possible way to sort of break this media disinterest um, in some of these issues. Uh, in terms of parallel and soft power initiatives, uh, I completely uh, agree with you, Mark. I think we are seeing new a new era in sort of governance at the UN, especially with China at the helm of many um, aspects, especially with the kind of contributions now they make monetarily. And I mean, I don't know if it's a surprise to others. I, I think it was a, a surprise to us that for the first time in this hearing, at least for me, uh, there was a security guard outside the door who was searching our bags. Uh, there was a security guard in the room. Both of them had guns. Um, and I've never seen anything like this. And the narrative around it was, you know, this is a hearing about ethnic minority issues. Tibetans and Uyghurs are around and, you know, things could get problematic. So we need the security. And I can be pretty certain without, you know, any official confirmation where that narrative comes from. So there's definitely that dynamic. But I think also it's important to recognize that China still wants to play at the world stage. Um, and, and so there are certain liberties it's not yet willing to take. But we've seen certainly, I mean, one of the issues while we were sitting there listening to the Chinese, the Chinese um, NGOs report uh, or the issues pertaining to, to China uh, was the internment of around one million Uyghurs in Xinjiang. And, and so there are certainly um, ways in which the Chinese government is willing to flout um, you know, whatever the international community may say. And I think the question for me often is, um, you know, what is the point in time where China stops caring about what people have to say about Hong Kong issues specifically? And I worry, I think, given the changes we've seen recently in the tactics deployed by government, uh, is that that time is probably sooner than we think. Yeah. Emily, do you have no, Claudia and then Emily. Also to share an observation on your question about the UN, um, the, the human rights process getting more corrupted. We would, uh, we have been 
um, communicating with the UN um, about this to hope that they would be more resilient to pressure from China and they hear us loud and clear. But it is um, already after the, um, the Secretariat took down a number of submissions to the UPR process. Mm. Um, so we are seeing the Secretariat not so resilient, but they, they, there are some forces in there trying to push back. And as for the treaty bodies, they are not as like politicalized by as um, Universal Periodic Review, which is done by the Human Rights Council. So in the treaty bodies, the, the, the committee members, they are still independent human rights experts, although they are selected by their countries, but they are still independent and they are experts on human rights. They are not politicians or diplomats. So... Um, we still have some hope on that side. I agree with Claudia that the, um, the, those treaty bodies, because I have seen so many of them, uh, they are more independent-minded than the UPR. But if you look at the China-UPR hearing in November, many countries, although they each had about 70 seconds to speak, many spoke out on, uh, on uh, China and on Hong Kong, which is quite, so it is, I guess, it's political. And Hong Kong, I mean, in these hearings on China and Hong Kong, Christ, I mean, we're like Disneyland. If you compare it with the Uyghurs, a million being locked up, and we talk about the ethnic minority education problem, some people will say, Jesus, what, what's happening? But the committee members are good. They commented on both the situation in mainland China as well as in Hong Kong. Because I told them, and I think they all agree, I said Hong Kong is not just little Hong Kong with its problems. We are part of the PRC, and we are still the freest and the safest city in the PRC. And I don't think the committee wants to see that destroyed. And they all agree. So the fact of trying to help Hong Kong to preserve Hong Kong's freedom is like helping China. If Hong Kong can continue to be free, it would be not just good for Hong Kong, but good for the whole of China and good for the international community. I don't think the international community wants to see a free, vibrant city being snuffed out. But that is a real possibility. So that's what we told the UN every time we went there. So they understand it. So when, although then you compare the problems of Hong Kong with that of mainland China, there's no comparison. So between problems of mainland China, you can talk about it for 10 years. You still haven't finished exploring them. So I think you know, some of the committee members know. And the strategy, in terms of uh, engaging the media, there's one thing that the media would be interested. It's the government. So that's why when I came back, I said we should engage the government. So if you succeed in getting a meeting with the government, the government officials there, although they may not be allowed to go into the meeting, but they will know you're meeting with the government. And then they will want to find out what the government said. So that's why I think we should put a lot more emphasis on securing that meeting. And as I said, okay. If you refuse to meet with us, I'll call a press conference and say you refuse. But then everybody has to be like me. <laughs> you know, there are people, as they say, who have all kinds of other reservations. So <laughs> I'm not everybody. I'm just me. <laughs> I'm prepared to do it. I've done it for so many decades. And as some officials said, Emily, why change a habit of a lifetime? Yes, I'm not going to change it, but there have to be other people who are prepared to do it like, with, like me. And the government knows that there are not. There are many people who have other th considerations. So, okay. Not that I'm saying that if you do it this way, it will definitely be so effective. But at least it's a bit more. I said, come on. Let's meet. Let's talk. How come you're not doing it? But if, if they say no, then no, we just let it die, <laughs> then it's not going to go very far. Phyllis? Um, in terms of the um, exploring, 
a, a good media story. I think it's very, very hard, especially for ethnic minorities, be it um, the local settlers or migrant domestic workers or even um, refugees asylum seekers, because they are the minority of the minorities. You're, you're exposing problems of minorities. So the majority mainstream people are not interested. And it's very hard to get their attention. And um, again, back to Pooja's um, point on backlashing. A lot of them, um, at least a lot of our service users, were brave enough to come up and post on you know, their social media. But then it's a lot of backlash that they face. It's a um, hate speech. And also um, sometimes it's, it's you know, um, even threat of violence. And so it deters them from, from standing up and and talking about their issues and problems and what the government can do for them. So this is, this is really, you know, very, it's, it's very, it's not encouraging for, for these people to do that. Um, but in terms of whether the, I, we, we, I still put trust in the committee because I'm still using their mechanism to push forth um, the, the, the policy change that we want to see. And what, I was very impressed was at the end of um, the hearing, one of the committee members actually said, because China was denying all these um, accusations, right? And then Hong Kong government didn't, didn't really come and defend themselves. And one of the members said, we're all experts here. It's like, we're all experts here. Don't make a fool of us. You, you don't, don't undermine you know, our intelligence. And I think he was very brave to say that. And, um, and that's why I feel at this point, I still have trust in the committee and I will still use these um, UN mechanisms to, to, to use them timely with our, with our campaigns and strategies. For example, af right after this coming next year will be the 10th year of the, um, the RDO enactment. And so what has the government done? We've gone through two of these hearings, and we've gone through ICCPR and other hearings as well, and nothing has been done, and we're into the 10th year of implementing the RDO. So there has to be changes. Yes, there, were, there are changes, but those are you know, very frivolous changes that it doesn't really affect anyone. And so we need to let the government know that we have to change. And then plus, ICCPR is coming. You're going to be... Um, up to international criticism if this is not being, being changed. So we catch the right timing as well. Sorry for the second bite at the cherry, but two thoughts occurred to me as others were reflecting. The first is, I, I think Emily made this point several years ago, that there may be times when nothing will change, but it's still important to, as a matter of record, put various things together and and engage in the process. Because if we disengage, then there will be no memory <laughs> that certain things were a particular way at a given moment in time. So I think that's the first thing to bear in mind, that there is a whole journey um, to change. And so sometimes we may just be reduced to the role of functioning as record keepers. Um, so that's still important from a historical perspective, um, because that serves as the benchmark for every country. And I think one of the committee members actually mentioned this as well in his remarks. So he said that, you know, we're measuring progress against ourselves. And so it is a, it's a good opportunity for a country to reflect uh, on the progress it has made relative to its own position a few years ago. The second thing that comes to mind is um, backlash. So one of the things about uh, minorities is that not only do they face this backlash from the, you know, the majority or the host community um, as a whole, but a lot of us also faced um, backlash from our own communities internally. So I know when I started this work, one of the first things that happened was a very senior member uh, of the Indian community in Hong Kong um, said to me that I'm actually tarnishing the good name of ethnic minorities in Hong Kong because a lot of Indian uh, ethnic minorities have been resident here for a long time and are really well to do. And by lumping us together with other uh, ethnic minorities not of a similar ilk, uh, I was actually dragging sort of our name down. And he actually asked me to stop. Right. Um, another member uh, of our delegation actually faced backlash from within her own community um, for uh, presenting a viewpoint that um, sort of others in her community disagreed with. I think most of them, it's fair to say, were male uh, who disagreed with her perspective, but also that she should be the voice of the community. And they questioned why her and why not someone else who they thought would be more suitable. They didn't have a candidate. But I think it irked them that it was a female who was being lauded as the first from their community to show up on behalf of the Nepalese at 
um, the UN. So there are all of these micro-level politics behind the scenes as well, which preclude us from engaging with the media in the traditional way. But I mean, of course, if you could, if, if you spun that story, there's really something there. Uh, if a young person has to contend with her own community and, uh, you know, deal with issues of discrimination and still show up in order for her voice to be heard and for the government to finally decide to do something, there's a story there for sure. Um, but it's a question again, it goes back, I think, to us as a society. I think um, in the current climate, where so much is happening globally, our standard for how bad things have to be before, you know, it makes a sensational story. Uh, I don't know, our, our, yeah, it's quite high, the threshold. Yeah. Any other questions? Comments? No, I know. I mean, it's, I, don't, I don't think that the small size of the audience is a reflection of the disinterest in these issues. I think it's because it's December 18th, and it is actually pretty much a holiday time for the university um, and for a lot of people. So, um, But um, I guess I just have one, one last quick question. If you could each just give maybe one piece of advice for advocates going forward. Um, what do you think advocates need to do or need to know? I mean, other than the points that you've already raised in, in the discussion so far, um, in dealing with, the, with these types of issues at the international level and also the domestic level. Maybe I'll just go one, one by one, and you can make a, a, a quick piece of advice for <laughs> human rights advocates. It can't be quick. Like, there will be so many advice. So many, I know. So, well, you, you've already provided a lot of advice in the course of the, right. of the seminar. So bear in mind that the international community, they are like, far away from Hong Kong. They, 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 they know the um, rights, but they don't know the um, situation in Hong Kong. So if you're going to advocate, you have to think from the perspective that you would want to make them understand and present the information that way and also be knowledgeable of the um, instruments that you are using like for example if you're going to search you have to know about the, the, the convention and also be creative um, in the past um, general comments and also other advocates from other countries have expanded um, like um, articles of uh, various human rights treaties to cover more issues, to make it more comprehensive. Um, so do that and um, try to um, repeat the same issue in the various uh, venues and someday you will get there. Okay. Emily? Well, I, I think it's very important to engage the younger generation. I've been there 30 years. <laughs> But I think it's important that we get the young people interested and be involved and to feel they want to, because it is a very huge process and maybe very boring and not easy to get to grips with. I think university, at the university, you people are doing a good job. And it's very important to let the young people know that what our rights are, why we should go so to the United Nations to talk about it. And otherwise, you know, maybe it's good that Claudia is interested, and I hope that you people at the university can carry carry on and get more youngsters to be galvanized. Um, for me, I would say stories matter. Uh, human rights committee members always ask for examples, and so it's very important to have concrete data or a story that you can point to that highlights um, the way in which the problem impacts the community. Um, for for me, I feel that um, human rights is a broad issue. It's it's not difficult to discuss, especially on, for example, freedom of speech, um, freedom of assembly. But fighting for a minority issue, be it disability, be it um, you know gender or even race, on its own, I think if um, if one person feels for it, one should not be afraid to talk about it. And to and to promote, you know, the lack of policies and the lack of of rights for the minority. It's it takes because for the minority, it's it's just us. Well, us who are who are affected, but it it tramples onto the it violates onto the you know rights of the, the, the principles of human rights. So it takes one gut and bravery to 
to talk about it to other people as well. That's how I thought, you know, to be a real advocate. I think uh, you, you've all made a, a very persuasive case <laughs> for sticking with it. Um, and I liked you know, the terms that came up, tena tenacity, sticking with it. Um, I mean, I started off the discussion today maybe perhaps on a slightly pessimistic note when I asked the question, um, is it worth our time and resources to actually engage? Um, but I think um, I'm feeling much more hopeful <laughs> um, at the end of and the hour and a half that this, that this actually does matter, um, and that this type of repetition, the holistic strategy that you've described, I mean, dealing with various UN human rights mechanisms, but also dealing with the government, um, dealing with the media, trying to come up with, you know, the, the various bits of strategy actually do, are, are, are very much worth um, connecting and coming up with, a, with an approach that could actually um, create possibilities and spaces for change. Um, I read a, a very um, interesting book, um, inspirational book recently that was uh, published last year by an international relations scholar from Harvard, um, Catherine Sickink, and called Evidence for Hope. Um, and she makes the case that actually when you're looking at effectiveness of international human rights law, what you should be looking at is actual empirical change over time. So not necessarily comparing, okay, what's the current situation with some ideal that's expressed in an international human rights treaty or somewhere else, but that it's looking at, and what Puja was saying about keeping track, I mean, staying engaged, keeping track of the progress, what are the issues? Um, and are we progressing? Are we retrogressing? Um, and that also helps us come up with, with creative solutions, I, I think. So um, I think that's very important. I was at a talk recently about the effectiveness of the International Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, um, and the person who was giving the talk cited some studies that show um, apparently policymakers um, tend to innovate once in their careers, <laughs> um, which is a, a little bit depressing. Um, but the other point that he made was that policymakers, they often know what the problems are. Yes, it's good to point out the problems and the issues, but they often know. And what they really need are, are solutions. And if they're not going to be all that innovative, then it's up to us to, to try to be creative and, and to help them come up with solutions to these problems that they, that they are already very much aware of. And so I think you've, you've made a lot of great suggestions in the discussion today about how we can move forward. Um, and next semester, and, and when, when more people are back from their, <laughs> their holiday, we will have, uh, you know, continue with our um, human rights seminar series at the center and have more discussions about human rights issues and international processes. Um, and also in celebration of the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which sort of kicked off on Human Rights Day, which was December 10th, um, but will continue throughout the year. And next year is the 20th anniversary of our LLM and Human Rights Program at Hong Kong U. So hopefully we'll have lots of exciting events, then, and please do come and join. Thank you all very much. <laughs>